Thank you, Ian Buckets Falcha. Hi, hello, and welcome. It's John O'Sullivan from the Irish Pagan School, and it's another kind of chat and check in here on YouTube. And the topic today is is fair questions and my personal perspective in regards to questions and how we at the school do our best to manage the multitude of questions that we receive. So as ever, thank you for being part of our community and um, those of you who are joining us and kind of catching the notifications and kind of dropping in with us, you've done the liking and subscribing, we're really, really grateful for that. Um, and it just means that we, we know we're doing the right things because we're getting the commentary and response. Um, but also we're getting different perspectives in the commentary, which is always great. Um, okay, sorry, caveats and addendums, not always great because sometimes we end up being targeted by people who have a, a such a vastly different perspective on certain topics to us that they almost see us as a target. Um, I, and by us, I mean Laura and myself and the Irish Pagan School and our community in many ways. Um, so, yeah, like it's 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 not always great. Um, but one of our kind of key things that we always try and do is curate our spaces to be accepting and welcoming and focus on the the purpose, really. The whole reason for all, doing all of this isn't to answer anyone's questions. It isn't to give answers. It's to give information. Um, and that's why the Irish Pagan School exists. You know, our motto is authentic connection to Ireland because there is so much content out there that may have roots in Irish mythology or lore or history or ancestry that has been changed or shifted or altered over time um, or lost to us because of colonization, because of, you know, targeted kind of destruction of our language or our history or our cultural, cultural ethnicity. There's so much kind of stuff that we have to be very cautious around working towards, but then also very conscientious about where the sources are. What are the resources? Where, where is it actually coming from? And that's why at the school, we work really hard to have native presenters. It's not just classes from myself. It's not just classes from Laura. We have many kind of classes. We're very delighted and honored to work with a number of different native Irish presenters and people who have such um, a vast knowledge of a particular section or field of Irish law or Irish language that we invite them in to kind of teach as well, someone like Morgan Donner. But um, yeah, we have like Amy Reardon of Crafty Kyliok has taught many classes with us, including a fantastic course on an introduction to the Irish language and the structure of the language. At the moment, we have Orla Costello um, of Bridget's Forge in, in the Facebook world, teaching and again, coming back to us and teaching again for the, the Bridget in Ireland. So it's talking about the, the, what the information, what the lore says, what the cultural kind of information has, and then how to connect with Bridget as someone who has worked as a Bridget devotee for, for decades of herself. And um, one of my personal favorites is Shane Broderick, who's an Irish folklorist who, uh, like, who has studied in, in US, University College Cork, UCC. And like he has fantastic information, absolutely beautiful stuff. And also as a, a photographer, and um, he has some amazing photography to go along with his presentations at the school from Irish museums, um, artwork, cultural kind of influences, very talented individual and very informed individual for the structures of the classes that we teach. So the reason why I'm telling you some of these people, oh, well, get, can't forget Geraldine. Um, um, Geraldine Merkins Byrne um, teaches on Driach's Gjol, which is like the, the magic of music and how Ireland has always been a lyrical language and how music has always been such a cultural influence. We've had Dr. Gillian Kenny in talking about the hidden histories of women in Ireland and medieval kind of representation of women in Ireland. Like, you know, we have had so many people teaching in our school that we're delighted to be able to kind of keep doing this because our focus for myself and Laura has never been to build up some cult of ego around ourselves or prop ourselves up above anyone in any way, shape or form. Our, our, our motto in many ways is a rising tide lifts all boats, you know? And that is that is something that we believe in. That is something that we work wholeheartedly for. And within, you know, native Irish speakers, native Irish presenters, we're not in animosity. We're not in competition with anyone. Like, you know, we don't see ourselves as opposed to anyone. We don't see ourselves as the only answer 
to you know people's question about Irish paganism or like Irish kind of history or Irish folklore or mythology. And that really kind of brings us to the question, this kind of topic of questions, because a lot of people find us because they have questions. They've had some kind of maybe a spiritual experience. They may have some ancestry kind of, you know, knowledge or history if they're diaspora or people descended from Irish immigrants. Um, like they may be people in Ireland themselves who are kind of waking up or kind of stepping away from the harm that's been done because of the Catholic Church in Ireland. Again, we're not anti-Christian. You know, Christianity is a beautiful expression of religion. It's another kind of form of you know spiritual path to follow. I do. I was a very active Christian for a lot of my time, but I learned very quickly that I was more a Christian and less a Catholic um, because of the structure and the organization and the harm that was being done uh, around that. So, you know, stepping away from the dogma and finding my way to the spirituality of things, uh, which over time led me to follow the questions and my own personal questions, which weren't answered within one particular path of faith to allow me to kind of explore other parts of spiritual practice and then finally to identify myself as pagan. Now, pagan, as I've mentioned before, point of definition, I always like to do this, pagan is not a specific path. There is no one pagan path. Pagan is an umbrella term for an expression of a variety of different spiritual beliefs, spiritual kind of paths or dogmas or religious practices, or um, I don't know any other way I could really define that. Um, but there are a number of different commonalities that exist within those very different types of spiritual belief that means they fit within this pagan umbrella term. Uh, I've mentioned them before, so it's earth-based spirituality or reverence for the earth, um, the involvement of meditation or introspection as part of the practice, and the belief in polytheism, which is multiple deities, the existence of multiple deities. Um, so what we try and do at the school is answer the questions. You know, one of the questions that we had when we were kind of coming up, not being able to find resources that were native to Irish or from our own history or from our own culture, a lot of the times we were only getting information that was coming from outside of Ireland, which has been colored by a certain kind of cultural expectation or experience outside of that. And so inherently there's going to be some differences as it comes in. Um, also then... There's a, a lovely class in school done by, by my partner, Laura, around Druidry um, and the origins of Druidry and how the roots and the origins of Druidry is actually within like um, countries that can be defined as Celtic countries or Celtic nations. And by that, Celtic is not a bloodline. Celtic is not a, an ethnicity. Celtic is a linguistic term. Actually, when you refer to the Celtic nations, you're saying you're, what you're referring to is a number of different cultures which had same linguistic roots to their language, uh, which recently has kind of drawn up a question as to whether or not Ireland is part of Celtic nations because it seems to have a rather different kind of root to some of its older Irish kind of linguistic or language structures. Um, but it's not a blood, it's not a DNA thing. You can't just turn around and say, yeah, pale skin, red hair, that's a Celt. That's not how that works. Um, which is why it's important to be able to kind of have those conversations around this and why we at the Irish Bank School believe that, you know, you don't have to have the DNA. You know, it's not about the blood that flows through your body. You know, it's about your spiritual connection and living and working in right relationship with not just the deities, but also the land, the culture, the living spiritual traditions, the living culture, the living people within the land. And that is one thing that we, we very much try and promote through our work in, again, having classes from a variety of native speakers. Um, so questions, <laughs> we get them a lot, which we're delighted to, because it means that we're obviously providing the right kind of information or enough information to stimulate people to have those spiritual progressions themselves, to kind of get to the point where it's like, actually, I need to know more, or I want to know more, or there's some kind of calling or computer or some kind of spiritual experience that I need to know more or find out information about. And that's the purpose of all of what we do. Now, there is no such thing as a bad question. You know, there can be bad intent behind questions, but the question itself inherently provides an opportunity to share a perspective. And that is one thing that I personally really value around questions. You know, if someone comes to me and says, yes, I have an answer, this is my answer, I was like, great, good for you, great, you know, you have your answer. But I'm more stimulated by someone who says, I have a question. 
I will never claim to know the answer, but I will always say, tell me the question because I'd be fascinated to find that out. Maybe it's something I can think about as well. Maybe it's something I have thought about. Maybe it's something we can have a discussion about and see if we can grow and share in our perspectives or, or collection of perspectives together which is why things like um, misinformation become such a problem, which is why it becomes so damaging because you, as, as someone so passionate about our spirituality, who kind of goes back to the ancient lore, the mythology, the history, the archeology span and the folklore, because those are all the roots that we try and pull into our teachings here. It's very frustrating to come across poor representations of deity, for example. Um, or misrepresentations of spirituality in many ways. Some of the more common ones with, that we don't come across is Lou. Um, Lou being kind of held up or idealized as this kind of Aryan-esque character because he's sun-visaged. Um, you know, he's called all bright, he's a sun god, etc. You know, but a lot of people don't really recognize or acknowledge the fact that Ru Lou could be defined as mixed ethnicity or mixed race. He's half Fomorian, half Tuatadanan. His mother was Fomorian, descendant of Balor. He's of two different tribes. And so it's galling to come across references to Lou held up in this racist or nationalist kind of or a standpoint, because that's not what it's about at all. Like he actually came as a child of two different tribes to try and bring unity back and to bring kind of balance of, to the disparate actually, yeah, to the imbalance of power that was caused by another person who was, you know, of two different tribes. Bress, the, the king who did things wrong uh, after the first Battle of Moitura, which then set up the second Battle of Moitura, was also of two tribes. His father was from Orion and his mother was Tua de So it's from a narrative kind of story example. That's one thing I love looking at when I, as a bard, as someone who kind of tears back the stories and looks at that. As you're telling the saga of things, you have, this one person, this one person of two tribes who favors one tribe over another, who doesn't kind of live in, in balance, doesn't kind of promote the right fair justice. And it's actually said in the first battle, in the, in the second battle of the the Catholic Torah, which is the main kind of saga of the Irish lore, um, that Bress favored his Fomorian ancestry. And um, he deposed all of their heroes. It said that the chieftains of Ireland did not find representation in the Hall of Bress. And when they went, they were without meat quick upon the fork, without breath or their ale being like, you know, smelling, of, their breath smelling of ale um, and without seeing their heroes and their champions, all but all that. And so it's that kind of thing that we are supposed to go to the king. The king of the country is supposed to represent everyone within the country and supposed to live within that right relationship of sovereignty between the representation of the people and the land itself. Breast does not do that favorably, which leads to the, the twisting of the laws of hospitality, leads to the corruptions of the, the judgments, the right rule, the right then to rule. And so Breath, by having a legal satire placed against him, is, is deposed. He's no longer fit his king. And he leaves Ireland and he goes to his dad, um, Alotha, and he's like, hey, you know, I need, I need an army to invade Ireland. And this is one thing I, I, I love as well. A lot of people kind of hold the Fomorians up as these monstrous creatures, these kind of giant, horrible creatures from under the sea, etc. That's complete fiction. Absolutely complete fiction. Um, brought about, probably, if you want to point at a source for the misinformation, you're looking at Slain from the 2000 AD comics series. Um, the Fomorians were not monstrous creatures. The Fomorians were just another tribe. In fact, um, Alotha, the father of Bress, was said to be beautiful, said to be extremely beautiful, so much so that when Bress's mom saw him, her heart broke because he was so gorgeous looking. So that's one thing I want to address as well, the dehumanizing of one particular tribe, how problematic that is. Um, but again, Bress goes to Alotha and he's like, I need an army to take back Ireland. And Alotha's first response is, it's bad form to try and take by force that which you could not keep by right rule. So even Alatha knows that, like, you know, you're demanding or trying to conquer when you you what you had it. All you had to do was judge fairly, judge in right rulership, um, lead in right balance in this kind of core criminalist, this right relationship, and it would have been fine. You failed in doing that. So if poor form to try and demand an army to try and take by force what you couldn't keep by doing the right thing. 
Um, he doesn't get a response that he likes from a lot, so Brett goes to Balor. Uh, and Balor, being one of the warlords, is like, yeah, absolutely, I'm happy to leave Raider Island. Which then leads us towards that conflict for the second battle of my tour, which then leads us to Lou coming in to fulfill his his own destiny as the grandchild of Balor to face his own bloodline and to kind of re-establish that balance. So from a narrative point of view, you have one child of two tribes who did not keep things in balance and everything broke apart, but it's then restored by another tribe, another child of two tribes who comes in to restore the balance and treat things fairly and go forward from there. You know, so it says that Lou, after the battle, rules for 40 years as king in Ireland. Um, so you don't rule for 40 years unless you're ruling rightly. You're actually maintaining that right relationship with you know the other world and with your people and your tribe and your country. So I know I've gotten sidelined there, but it's important to kind of talk about what the actual information says, what the mythology, what the, the, the sources that we have say as opposed to take Lou and twist him into this, you know, ridiculousness or ridiculous representation of, say, masculinity or um, racial purity, as we have seen, uh, unfortunately done, or to demean him the other way, where people kind of make reference to the fact that Lou was demeaned by the Catholic Church and, you know, he was pushed down so much that the deity became the leprechauns. That's wrong. That's 100% wrong. Um, and you could, if you wanted to point at misinformation for there, Neil Gaiman, with his um, amazing books, like American Gods, he talks about this character, Mad Sweeney, who is a leprechaun. Um, and, you know, it's then found out later on that he is, he's Lou. He had, had lost his memory and he was actually an Irish god, Lou. Um, and so that's where that correlation, that misinformation, because of fiction, comes back in and people try and keep, like connect themselves spiritually through that misinformation it leads to a lot of trouble it leads to a lot of difficulties um, and in some cases it leads to a lot of backlash from certain deities who don't like to be misrepresented misrepresented um, I'm, I'm sitting with my back to the Morrigan altar and the Dagda's altar is right, right below that now, the Dagda for example another great one totally misrepresented by caricature because there's one reference to him, one physical description of him in the second battle of Moitura where he's described after a failed attempt to keep peace with the Fomorians and he kind of eats an entire pit full of horrible porridge that they've made for him to try and get him to insult their hospitality, justifying their invasion and their war. He doesn't do it. He eats all of the food because he, he, he sacrifices his physical form, really, and becomes this distended, bloated kind of person who has to stagger his way out of the camp because he's so grossly obese from what he had to do. But that then becomes the thing that's hooked upon. And people have the Dagda's image as this grossly obese fat guy with his stomach hanging out over his kind of like laying his trousers, etc. You know, he's a big guy, absolutely. But he's not obese. Like he's he's not that. Now again, big again, I don't want to get into concerns over like food issues or fat shaming. That's not, I'm a big guy myself. I know what it's like, but it's how the wording is used. That's how the information is is twisted by intent, which is why questions are so important, which is why being able to have an open discussion on things, get to the point where people can leave ego aside, leave kind of defensiveness aside to a certain degree. And be able to kind of say, actually, let's explore. <clears throat> sorry, let's explore this together. Let's kind of explore this information. Let's explore what we know, what we think we know, and then try and find our way through to a truth that is understood and accepted by everybody. That is the purpose of the school. That is the, what this is all actually about. And there is so much of the ancient resources not translated yet. There are so very few people who can translate old Irish. I'm not talking like current Irish or Middle Irish, which is medieval Irish. We're talking old Irish, which goes back. We're talking like 9th century, 900 to 1100 BC, BCE, or common era. That's the language. And the examples that we have from the Yellow Book of Lekin, the Book of the Dunkhead, the Book of Vermoy, the Book of Kells, the Book of Leinster, all of these monastic tomes is in old Irish. And there are so few people who can do it, one of which is 
Morgan Daimler, which is why we are delighted to include them amongst our repertoire catalogue of teachers here in the school. So the purpose of questions, yes, uh, we get a lot of them and we do our best to answer them, but we don't always get, we don't always have time to come back to each individual person and to connect with each individual person. We'd love to, but we don't. So we try and provide resources in, in blog posts. We try and provide this kind of community channel where we can have these recordings to point back people back to, which is why the questions are really great. Being able to answer those community questions is so important to us here. And um, because we do have a large community around our teaching and around our kind of classes and our social media spaces. And by providing these kind of information that remains within the internet's it means that you know we don't have to do the work every single time. We can say, actually, I've got a good resource on this. Here's that. Here's an answer to those questions. And um, because a lot of people do come across the same questions or the same kind of nuances within a question or an experience. So that's how we kind of go about it. And also the other side is it, it's about energy. You know, when we talk about relationships, we talk about this communication, this exchange of information, we're also exchanging a certain amount of energy. And so there are kind of times when we're like, actually, I don't think I have it in me to answer that question just now. Or, you know, I do a lot of work to try and answer a particular question and it may not balance out, like, you know, for me in regards to that exchange. Now, I don't want to come across as being mean or bad about this, but it is about making sure I'm effective. That's what it is, about energy effectiveness. John, you did a video on like <laughs> sensitivity and sensibility. This is the same thing. You know, when you're able to kind of provide spiritual guidance for someone, it takes a certain amount of empathy. It takes a certain amount of exchange or understanding or compassion or knowledge in order to provide that guidance back and to kind of answer the questions for them. And we don't get to do that all of the time. Or there has to be enough kind of built in to make allowances or to make space for those kind of things. And that's why we have the consultation option within the Irish Pagan School. If someone is in need of a spiritual consultation, we don't want to miss, miss that opportunity. But there is that, you know, intrinsic value involved in that time. So more times than not, you know, you might not need a direct answer yourself. That's why we do these, these videos. That's why we do like the resource videos. Um, that's why Laura has so many resource videos, both here and in Laura's personal YouTube, in the social media spheres, everywhere we go, we try and give as much content as possible so that people can access the resources that they need to. But we also do want to make space for those times when things don't kind of answer for themselves or you, can't, you haven't been able to get to just the right answer that you've been looking for and you might need a, a second set of eyes on it. That's why that consultation exists. Um, so there's one last thing I want to talk about in questions as well. I get asked, like, you know, John, how do you how do you deal with the difficult questions? And there are multiple different types of difficult questions. Some of them are difficult because of the emotion involved, the spiritual connection involved, the knowledge involved. If I don't know an answer, I will tell you, I don't actually know the answer. I will try and find resources to figure it out with you. I'll try and kind of point you to resources, but I won't plumb you. I won't lie to you and say, oh, well, yes, actually, you know, th there's no value for that. There's, you're doing more harm than good by just lying about that. Um, but there are also some questions that, you know, they just don't, it's far too much energy to try and make that education work. And by that, I mean those questions which are sent with intent to absorb energy to take up that time to undermine all of the work and um, we do get that as well unfortunately you know as i mentioned at the top end you know we don't we're not positioning ourselves as the one and only answer we don't want that we want as many voices as possible to speak because then we get a broader perspective a broader awareness and a, a healthier kind of growth to paganism in all of ireland and around the world you know it's not about one person being the answer to it or, or how, holding all of the answers and kind of, you know, miserly handing them out in order to raise their own, uh, what's the word, authority or their own perceived value in the community. That's not us. 100% that's not us. Um, but there are times where, like, you know, people perceive us as the big bad Irish pagan school, like, you know, keeping information behind paywalls or, you know, being elitist in regards to our approach to spirituality. Um, and that's that's saddening. 
it is saddening. I actually feel bad about it um, because it means that we, we haven't been able to connect and communicate with that person effectively. Something has actually happened somewhere outside of us that they have this perception of us that means they can't come true. They can't kind of join us at the table. They can't kind of take their seat and, and learn and share. Um, and to be honest, sometimes that's okay. You know, we have certain guidelines and structures around all of our social media spaces, um, which we have a very active moderation team, which we're absolutely delighted about. And we're very, very honored to have so many members of the community supporting us there. But they're told very clearly that, you know, these spaces are designed to be safe spaces. As much as, you know, there is the broad internet and the wild virtual spaces out there, we work really hard to carve off a safe space. So all of our spaces are kinds of good. All of our spaces will respect people's pronouns. All of our place, spaces will stand up to racism, ableism, sexism, you know, all of the homophobia. We will not stand for any of that in any of our spaces. And, you know, we have such a supportive community and such an amazing moderation team that people can feel safe coming to our spaces, which is what it's all actually about at the end of the day. You know, being able to get to the space where you can engaging your own spiritual growth in a safe environment, you know, as much as possible. And so there are times where, you know, our mods have to kind of step in and say, actually, sorry, you know, you do realize the language you just used in your post there was ableist, you know, or you do realize that, you know, the language you used, the etymology of that phrase comes from racism or sexism or homophobia. Hey, hi, you just shared a link from, you know, this group there or whatever, um, they're notably fascists. So, you know, yes, we need to kind of make sure we have those curated and we educate first as much as possible, but we do remove people from our spaces. And that's probably how we get the rep of being like the big bad Irish pagan school, kicking people out. You know, every, every kind of person removed from our community spaces because they have proved themselves repeatedly to be a risk or a hazard to our community spaces. Despite how many times we have offered them questions in order to share in that perspective. You know, hey, hi, can you provide the resources for that information you provided? That's us wanting to know where you're getting your information from, not to denigrate you or not to kind of like, oh, well, well, well. you know, it's more like, you know, well, actually, I may not know that resource or, you know, we might be able to provide more content for that or more context for that. So questions, questions are not bad things. Questions are opportunities. Every time a question is an opportunity for someone to share in a perspective, in a dialogue, in a exchange of ideas. So how can that be a bad thing? So intentionality, you know, aside, <laughs> some people, as I mentioned, will ask a question just to, I think the, the term is called sea line. They keep asking a question or trying to ask a question and their intent behind it is not to find an educational growth for themselves. It's to just take up space or take up time or to you know, drain people of their resources or their ability to respond. Um, unfortunately, that does happen to in certain communities. But we are very conscious of those things. We try and work really hard to make sure that all of our community is accepting and compassionate first. And um, then also, you know, very clear guidelines on, you know, defending their spaces. And I keep saying, you know, I need to, need to work on my practice for presentation skills. <laughs> so um, I've been talking for a while. And yeah, I just wanted to come in, maybe give you a bit of a perspective, again, on the Irish Pagan School, what all of it is actually about, why we do it, what's the purpose behind it, and to maybe offer the fact that, you know, questions are good. And... Maybe you should, you know, again, ask us a question in the comments when you do like and subscribe if you like to. Um, or, you know, maybe you just need to sit with your questions or, you know, realize that not every question is supposed to have an instant answer. Sometimes the question is the opportunity to go on a journey, the opportunity to grow and learn and to figure things out. Because um, that's really when knowledge meets experience and becomes wisdom. So from me here, thank you very much for stopping by. Do look after yourself. Remember, you're an amazing person in this world. You're the only one of you that will ever exist, um, quantum realities aside. <laughs> but even then, 
quantum signatures will differ. So take care of yourself, look after yourself, and until next time, salam, goodbye.